The album which helped heavy metal cement its status as one of the lead musical genres of the 1980s and helped Judas Priest transition from being metal musicians to becoming metal gods. Released on the 14th of April in 1980, British Steel is the sixth studio album by the legendary UK heavy metal band Judas Priest. And so, just as we do with every Judas Priest album in the Defenders of the Faith series, let's take a look at some of the lesser known facts about one of the most iconic metal albums of all times. And while you're watching, please do not forget to subscribe to Metal Pilgrim channel on YouTube to not miss out on more exclusive Judas Priest and not only content. Here you go! British Steel is nearly spotless, starting with its music, going into the production, imagery and its name. And not only because of the obvious implications, you know, Judas Priest is a British band and they play heavy metal, but also because of the socio-economic situation in the United Kingdom in the late 70s and the beginning of the 80s and actually around the entire Europe back at that time. For those of you who are not from the United Kingdom, I think it's worth pointing out that British Steel is in fact a name of the monolithic metal manufacturing company a steel producing giant, if you will. And British Steel was in fact one of the main employers back in the day for all young working-class Englishmen, you know, who also happened to listen to heavy metal. In addition, years before working on this album, Glenn Tipton has actually worked at British Steel for nearly five years. And he remembers that working at British Steel had an uttermost effect on him personally. In fact, throughout the years, and I spoke about that multiple times, both in our Defenders of the Faith series and Tolkien vs. Metal series, the pioneers of heavy metal, the two bands, Judas Priest and Black Sabbath, said in multiple occasions that it is the sound of the heavy metal factories, the fumes and the gloom of them, which helped them develop the musical style of their own and forge heavy metal in the early 70s. In addition to that, British Steel Corporation workers were on strike back then and therefore it got huge media attention. And so it is still not exactly sure whether it was Rob Halford or Ian Hill, the two guys can't really get their story straight, to be honest with you, who came up with the name. Yet it is this name which represented everything the band was and the entire heavy metal industry was at that time. Funny fact, Columbia Records actually like to play around with the name a bit. And so the first copies of British Steel album in the United Kingdom were sold at the discount price of £3.99 which was just two dollars back then, with a promotional campaign saying British Steel. Not sure if it was for this campaign or for music itself or for some other reasons, but the album of course was selling pretty well. By the time Judas Priest hit the studio to record British Steel, it's been almost a year since Margaret Thatcher became the first female Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And even though Judas Priest never wore a political band, Respecting the law, respecting the law. They actually decided to break that rule on British Steel. The unemployment rate in the United Kingdom at the time of the album recording has skyrocketed. And millions of young people, not only across the United Kingdom, but actually across the entire Europe, felt not only uncertainty, but felt like they were unheard. Well, good thing we don't live back in those times. Everything has changed now, right? Yeah. And so with British Steel, Judas Priest became the voice of the young people across the world. In addition to being a kick-ass party anthem, Breaking the Law is definitely one of those politically charged songs. There I was completely wasting out of work and down. Yep. You see, that was the voice of every young working class Englishman back in a day. And the same thing, of course, continues on Grinder. or on a great single on United, for which, by the way, the band has been accused of racism. What? You see, increasing the unemployment rate, in addition to opening borders and uh, rather liberal immigrant policies, spiked the rise of multiple working-class young subcultures who also happen to be quite racist. And so many actually thought that in the United song, Judas Priest has been flirting with those groups quite a lot, asking them to unite under one banner and stop the process of the outsiders taking over their jobs. They were not. 
cover artwork became one of the most legendary and iconic heavy metal album artworks of all times and a great merchandise seller. Shut up and take my money! Designed by Roslav Zyber, of whom we speak quite a lot in this series, to be honest with you, the album artwork shows a hand holding a razor blade. In the original British Steel album artwork, by the way, the razor blade was actually cut in through the fingers with the blood pouring from them. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Yet both CBS Records and Judas Priest thought that it actually might be offensive and a little bit too much for some countries. And of course they did not want to go through all the troubles they had with the Killing Machine slash Hellbent for Leather album, you know what I'm talking about. And so they decided to tune it down just a notch. In fact, Rob Halford in his latest book Confess remembers how when he saw that cover artwork, the final one, he actually thought to himself and said to the band that Judas Priest is a heavy metal band and therefore they're so kick-ass that they do not even bleed when they get cut. Yeah, a cheesy story, I know, but I kinda like it. By the way, British Steel also happens to be the only Judas Priest album artwork in which the logo is not a standalone one and is incorporated in the artwork itself. The album was recorded at Ringo Starr's studios at Tiddenhurst Park, which he previously has purchased from John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And since both Rob Halford and Glenn Tipton were huge fans of the Beatles and the house was full of memorabilia, including, of course, the legendary White Royal Piano, both Glenn and Rob spent hours and hours digging through the countless artifacts which were in that house. The house then, of course, had enough room for each band member and Tom Allen, who joined the band while on a recording session, to have a separate room. Glenn Tipton then took the legendary room with the grand white piano, and it is in this room that Judas Priest knocked out most of the hits for the British Steel album. Yeah. Tom Allen knew that Judas Priest's strength is in their live performances. And so the producer decided to take that strength and channel it to the studio. You see, before that, Judas Priest would always record a drum track first and then they would record all the other instruments on top of it. Yet on British Steel, Tom decided that it would be best if Judas Priest recorded all of the tracks all together, like if they were on stage. And so the entire band, including the band's newcomer Dave Holland on drums, uh, for whom it was the very first studio album with Judas Priest, would get in the studio all together and knock out the classic banger. In addition, it is this album which established the Judas Priest writing team with K.K. Downing, Glenn Tipton and Rob Halford. I think it's no secret for pretty much any Judas Priest fan that Glenn Tipton and K.K. Downing weren't really best buds for most of the time. In fact, I actually think that this rivalry is partially what has been driving Judas Priest to develop its trademark sound. Yet, as the band was gaining popularity, both CBS Records and Judas Priest members themselves were slightly afraid that the rivalry over the right and rights would actually cause the band's breakup. And so, instead of walking on the razor's edge, you see what I did there? The three main songwriters actually decided that they would, from now on, produce and develop all of the songs together. Yet, despite getting their stuff together and having a significant budget from Columbia Records to record British Steel, the technological advance wasn't quite there yet. Namely, there weren't samples. And that, in fact, has been limiting the creative abilities of so many bands around the globe at that time. But not Judas Priest. Man, all these bands are just ripping off Judas Priest. You want a police siren sound in the middle of the song? Just ask KK Downing to make some weird noises on guitar and Tom Allen to play around with it a little bit. And if you want to write a song about metal titans taking over the world and produce a sound which they would have produced if they would walk the earth, just shake some cutlery in front of the mic. By the way, the song Metal Gods was inspired by Queen's News of the World album artwork and was meant 
about the machines taking over the world. And Rob Halford and the guys had no idea that they just earned themselves a nickname. And this is what distinguished Judas Priest from most bands of that decade. They did not look for an excuse, they looked for an opportunity to become number one heavy metal band of all times. In addition, Judas Priest took the best of the two worlds, with punk rock getting most of their attention in the late 70s. The band then decided to take what people loved in punk rock, including its energy and the song structure, and incorporate it into heavy metal. And if so, if you take a look at every song on the British Steel album, you will not find a song longer than five minutes. I mean, technically, you don't have to be old to be wise, it's five minutes, four seconds, but you get what I'm saying. In addition, the band dropped all of the depressive lyrics for which heavy metal has been famous before 1980s and incorporated the aggression of the punk rock movement. And I believe that in such way, Judas Priest's British Steel became the culmination of what heavy metal was in 1980. By the time when Judas Priest was almost done recording British Steel, Tom Allen came to Rob Halford and said that there is a young band out on the front door asking if they could come in and absorb what Judas Priest has been doing and learn from them. That young band was Def Leppard. Apparently the two bands had an amazing time together and Def Leppard, being huge Judas Priest fans, were extremely thankful for the band allowing them to watch how they recorded British Steel. And it's ironic that in a couple of days afterwards, the management confirmed the Judas Priest touring dates with the support act of another young band, Iron Maiden. The truth is, none of the Judas Priest band members back then knew who Iron Maiden were. Yet, in a couple of days, K.K. Downing read in a newspaper Paul Diano's interview, in which he had said that Iron Maiden would blow Judas Priest off the stage. What? What the fuck? Rob Halford and the rest of the guys back then thought that this was extremely funny and clever, in fact, because this is exactly what Judas Priest has been doing with the bigger bands when they performed with them. I think they said exactly the same thing about ACDC on a tour before that. Yet KK Downing took it as a personal offense and challenge. And so KK actually tried to convince the management and the band to cancel Iron Maiden as an opening act and had multiple verbal fights with the band's leader, Steve Harris. Yet the tour still happened. And honestly, nowadays, 41 years later, I cannot imagine how epic it was to see those two bands on one stage in one night. In fact, it was on that tour that the Judas Priest imagery was complete with all the leather and chains. And in addition, Rob Halford actually brought a real machine gun with him on stage every night and would fire fake bullets at the crowd. Can you imagine how epic that was? Yet, because of KK's ability to hold grudge, the two bands did not really get along, except for one night. In Confess, Rob Halford remembers that on one night and on one night only, the two bands would go out together and get absolutely wasted. And the guys actually had a lot of fun together. So much fun that Rob Halford remembers he actually wanted to come on to Paul Diano, yet he didn't. Maybe for best. By the way, isn't it an interesting coincidence that Judas Priest's sixth studio album, British Steel, was released on exactly the same day as Iron Maiden's self-titled debut? And while we started speaking about leather and chains, I asked that in a previous episode and I will ask that again. Since there are just so many Judas Priest albums, we all know how many, I was thinking about expanding the Defenders of the Faith series and speaking about Judas Priest's influence on the heavy metal fashion, on the music industry, speaking about that notorious lawsuit and so on and so forth, especially since there are no album birthdays for the next month or so. And so I wanted to ask you, what do you personally think? Should we do that? And if so, please do let me know in the comments uh, whether I should do that and which topics you would like me to discuss. Let's all brainstorm together and see where this series might take us. In addition to the CBS Records British Steel promo campaign, of which we spoke in the beginning of this episode, this album is famous for its marketing. 
And to be honest with you, I have no idea whether it's genius or utterly stupid. In order to promote British Steel, the Judas Priest London PR agent Tony McBrain thought that it would be genius to fabricate a story about the upcoming Judas Priest album's master tapes having been stolen and held for ransom and the band having to pay 50,000 pounds to get those back. Several publications then ran that story and it is for this prank that Tony McBrain later on got a nickname of Tony No Brain. Yeah, to be honest with you, if it was not for this campaign, I have no idea whether we would ever see the cheesy yet legendary music video for Breaking the Law. You don't know what it's like. By the way, the British Steel promo campaign was the very first one to feature two full-budget concept music videos, an entire year before MTV was launched. What? Tony once again thought that it would be genius to fabricate another story, this time about Rob Halford filming a porn video. Well, not sure if it was good or bad for the PR, but only one tabloid newspaper in the United Kingdom, News of the World, decided to run that story. And it also happened to be the only newspaper that drops parents read at that time. So yeah, in Confess, Rob remembers that he had a lot of explanations to do for his mom and dad. Well, either way, we'll never know whether it was for these campaigns or despite of them, but British Steel landed at number 4 in the UK charts and became golden and later platinum in the United States. The original British Steel tracklist, in the order in which the band intended it to be, was supposed to start with Rapid Fire and going into Metal Gods on side A, and You Don't Have to Be Old to Be Wise going into Living After Midnight on side 2. And this is the tracklist order with which the album has been released in the United Kingdom, and this is the order I knew growing up. Yet in the United States and Japan, CBS Records decided to mess it up once again. They kinda do it on every other Judas Priest album, don't they? And so the releases in those countries would start on both sides with the most commercial songs. This is the first press Judas Priest British Steel album from the United States, and as you can see, it actually starts with Breaking the Law, going into Rapid Fire, and side 2 starting with Living After Midnight, going into Don't Have to Be Old to Be Wise. By the way, where did they lose the U? It's supposed to be you don't have to be old to be wise. You don't have to be old to be wise. And the original CDs would also feature the Ron order once again. The Judas Priest intended original tracklist order would be restored across the globe only in 2001 with the first remastered versions. Literally the same thing which happened with almost every other Judas Priest album released before that. Even now, in the 21st century, it is hard to fully comprehend the amount of influence British Steel had on the music industry. And note how I'm not saying on the heavy metal industry, on the music industry. James Hatfield of Metallica at some point said that Judas Priest was everything they wanted to be as a band while starting out. Well, again, not really musically, because musically they wanted to be more like Motorhead. And I guess it's no coincidence that it is Rapid Fire, the most thrash-like song from British Steel, which Metallica had performed with Rob Halford on multiple occasions. The legendary Dimebag Daryl of Pantera said at some point that British Steel has changed the way he thought of so many things. And yeah, in case you were wondering, it is the British steel razor blade he was wearing around his neck. And the list, of course, goes on and on and on. With every song on this record being a hit, I personally cannot really choose my favorite one. But what I wanted to know is what song do you consider the strongest one from British Steel and why? Please do let me know in the comments. I'm really curious to find out what song do Judas Priest fans around the globe consider the strongest one from the legendary iconic British Steel album and why? And while you're down there in the comment section, please do not forget to vote on expanding the Defenders of the Faith series and drop in some of the 
topics which you want us to discuss in this series. Write that down, write that down! As always, thank you so much for watching, guys. Please do not forget to like and share this video to spread the word about this project. But most importantly, please do not forget to subscribe to the Metal Pilgrim YouTube channel to stay tuned with all the updates and not miss out on more exclusive Judas Priest and not only content. Keep rocking!